In this video, we want to con con conclude talking about the basic techniques of capital budgeting. And so we'll talk about a couple other techniques, but we also want to kind of uh, describe a little bit of the relationship between net present value and internal rate of return, um, just to kind of pull this all together at one place. So another technique is something called the payback period. Quite simply, this is just how long it takes for you to get your money back. A good example of this is if I borrowed $100 from you and I said I'll pay you $25 a week, how many weeks will it take for you to get your money back? The answer, of course, is four. So what we want to do is try to analyze how the cash flows come to the company. We're going to predict those, but then offset them against the cost to find out when the company will receive all of those cash flows. So let's see how this might work for a particular project. So here's project L. We spent $100, then we got 10, then 60, then 80. <clears throat> well, as you can see here, what? At, if we got $10 back the first day, there were $90 left for us to recover. You got $60 the next year. That means you have $90, uh, $30 left to recover at the end of year two. Now, year three, we got $80. So $80 is obviously more than the 30 that we haven't recovered. So that means somewhere in year two, in the middle between two and three, we recovered all of the cash flows. So to calculate this, you take this cumulative amount, right? How much we still owe, divide that by the amount coming in, tells you what percentage of this cash flow was needed to get us to zero. So in this case, it was 2.375 years. And if you look at this again, compared to uh, S, you will see that in the end, um, S has a payback period of 1.6 years. So an additional variation of this is to use present values. So instead of subtracting the, the absolute value, find the present value of each future cash flow and then do the payback technique. In this case, L takes roughly 2.7 years using the discounted payback method. So why use the discounted payback method? Number one, it's not difficult to use. It's just time value, right? And Excel does time value quite easily. Um, but uh, it, it, it at least um, looks at cash flows, right? The present values of cash flows rather than raw numbers. So again, the payback period for project uh, L is 2.38, 1.6 for S. So obviously S is better than L because it gets your money back quicker. If you look at the discounted payback period, you also see that S has a number that's less than, uh, has, has a lower payback period, so it would be acceptable. Now the question is, if these two projects were mutually exclusive, we know which one we would choose. But what if they were independent? We need to have a number, right? What is an acceptable number for these projects? So let's say that we want a payback period of two years. Well, if you want a payback period of two years, Project L will not get your money back in time. S will. Likewise, the discount period. Maybe we want 2.5 years. Still, L would be unacceptable and S would be acceptable. So again, we have to have some rules for this payback period. So what are the strengths of this method, right? The strengths are provides an indication of risk, right? Getting your money back quicker is better than later. It's very easy to calculate and understand. 
What are the primary weaknesses? Well, it ignores the time value of money, unless we use the discounted payback technique, of course. And it ignores any cash flows after the payback period. Receiving cash is always good. This technique ignores future cash flows beyond this particular time frame. And this last one is there's no real relationship between payback and wealth maximization. So it doesn't tell us whether or not this is a good project to provide value to the company or not. It just fulfills this need of getting cash quicker rather than later. Another technique is something called the profitability index. It's a very similar uh, formula to the net present value formula, right? So if you remember, we have a basic investment rule says if the value of something is greater than or equal to its price, you would like to buy it. So now if you divide both sides by value, or excuse me, by price, right, then if the value divided by the price, if that's greater than or equal to one, you would want to buy the asset. And the value divided by the price is the profitability index. So if companies want to look at this technique, right, essentially it tells us, look, does the company provide more value than at the cost? And of course, higher numbers are better. So if we go back and look at our example, we see what the profitability index for L 1.19 and the profitability index for S is 1.2. As long as the profitability index is greater than one, it's providing more value than cost, it's acceptable. Independent, you would do them both. Mutually exclusive, you would only do S. Now, let's look at some issues with net present value internal rate of return. And it's not necessary that you really understand the process here. The, you don't need to understand why the math works this way. We just need to understand that there are projects that create issues with internal rate of return. And that project that we're talking about, or that challenge, if you will, is if we have non-normal cash flows. Remember, normal cash flows, negative, followed by a series of positive. In this case, we don't have that. We have a negative cash flow out here. So how do you calculate this? Net present value calculates it quite easily, but the internal rate of return will not calculate this. Uh, if you're using a financial calculator, it will not calculate this. It will give you an error message. So what does this tell us? Well, if we were to look at the net present value profile of this particular project, what we would find is it actually provides us with two internal rates of returns. Every time there's a sign change, mathematically, there is a potential answer to this rate of return question with internal rate of return. It, it's just a function of the math. And of course, having two answers makes things very complicated. In fact, every time it changes, if it changed four times, there's the potential for four answers. So again, anytime you have a non-normal cash flow stream, that should automatically trigger that, ooh, internal rate of return is gonna have some issues and we have to be careful. So at very low discount rates, right? One of these answers is gonna be positive, right? And the other one's gonna be negative. So at very high discount rates, right? We're gonna have differences, right? So again, this, this gives us this 
two internal rate of return model. And again, I'm not so concerned that we understand the process. It's just a function of the math. So what does this tell us? What do we do for this? Well, if there's non-normal cash flows, internal rate of return will just not do a good job for us. So we need to do the modified internal rate of return. And in this example, if you use the internal rate of return, the modified internal rate of return is 5.6%. And that's lower than the discount rate of 10%. So that means that the uh, modified internal rate of return, just as net present value, would say that these projects are, or this project P, is unacceptable. So again, that's just a little bit of a complication to the capital budgeting world. We just have to be uh, cognizant that there are projects that cre will create some issues with certain techniques. And we have to be able to apply something, some tool to be able to analyze it properly. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.